Hello, and thank you so much for joining me this evening for this rescheduled, now virtual presentation of Meet the Archivist. Um, tonight, I will be reading excerpts from A Field Guide to Embodied Archiving, published by Borough Press in 2021, and Notes from the Archivist, forthcoming, forthcoming uh, winter 2024 by Bodyless Editions. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Borough Press, as well as the Hand Art Center for their flexibility and assistance in organizing and promoting this event. And I would also like to give special thanks to Hurricanes Helene and Milton for their creative direction in our transition to a virtual platform. Um, a little bit about the books I'm gonna be reading from tonight. A Field Guide to Embodied Archiving. The Center for Post-Capitalist History invites you to consider your own body and subjectivity in relation to the writing of history. As a field guide, this publication has a goal of helping you identify your own body as a valuable archive of information. Through this process, your body archive reveals inconsistencies between capitalism's promises of infinite progress and the reality of the unsustainable and destructive nature inherent in its systems of production. You can purchase it through Borough Press, link in bio. Uh, Notes from the Archivist, a collection of fragmented writings and photographs, is a parafictional derive through the sensory landscape of declining coastal central Florida's late capitalist spectacle from the perspective of the Archivist of the Center for Post-Capitalist History. The second publication project of the Center for Post-Capitalist History by myself, artist and writer Leia Sandler, Notes from the Archivist chronicles the archivist's attempt to log shifting scales of time through accretions of daily life in the form of journal entries, memorandums, manifestos, and photographs. Thank you so much. The Center for Post-Capitalist History seeks to develop a methodology of archiving that will survive the strains on preservation faced by our post-collapse world. Imagine being able to quantify how precious your time is! Imagine an algorithm for the for the while we are no longer able to actively hold and preserve collections, our efforts are focused on developing alternative modes of recording. Imagine, imagine, imagine an algorithm capable of determining the monetary worth of any individual's lifespan. With 99.9% .9 accuracy, this algorithm factors in locality, proximity to sacrifice zones, likelihood of experiencing systemic oppression, debt, 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 and understanding history. We are working to develop an understanding of history that is sensitive to the environmental, material and social rigours of our world. We have seen the irrevocable damage inflicted by capitalism's fundamental system of decontextualization and extraction. We seek to broaden our understanding of history and plant the seeds of a better future. We will use the knowledge and tools available within our discipline to reconsider the epistemological violence that led to the acceleration and collapse of capitalism by tearing the discipline apart limb by limb and rebuilding it with intentionality. We are witnesses of the consequences of the mistakes of our past. We recognize that the human scale of time exists within the geological scale of time. We begin with our bodies in context. algorithm factors in health conditions, predicted lifetime salary, heartbreaks, invisible labor, transportation, familial obligations, mental health, patterns of consumption, and countless other data points to determine your time value coefficient. We collect a DNA sample and your W2 and provide you with priceless knowledge. Don't, 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 don't waste another second. Call now. A note from the archivist. The physical integrity of the archive's holdings is constantly at risk from a myriad of influences, both external, environmental, social, and outside the body archive, and internal, psychological, physical, physiological, and within the body archive. 
Through programs of body archive inventory, these threats are identified. In addition to the primary threats to the archive listed above, the following additional threats have been identified. Structural violence, damaging psychological adaptations, work-related injuries, starvation, disposal due to instability, physical and emotional, fire, attack by wild animals, random violence, old age, overdose, natural decay, hurricanes, infection, periodontal disease, predatory financial institutions, sun damage, flood, and instability of substrate. The Body Bureaucratic Manifesto. We recognize the fragility of our basic human needs and the necessity of caring for one another. The body bureaucratic is composed of the body in many forms and its interconnected, entangled, symbiotic collaborators. We recognize the urgent need to dismantle the hierarchies and systems incongruent with the body bureaucratic and its primary functions. When the functioning of the body bureaucratic is impeded by external bureaucracies, they will be severed and subsequently dissolved by the body bureaucratic. We begin with our bodies in context. Where do we go from here? The body bureaucratic assigns organ systems and viscera in its implementation of utopias. We urgently desire and create a better world. Our heads, our hands, our hearts, our labor. The body bureaucratic will ensure the construction of our collective futures with tenderness, slowness, and nourishment. We will nourish one another. The body bureaucratic may chew, swallow, digest, and expel waste. These processes may be considered a primary function of the organization. We hold one another close and breathe deeply. The body bureaucratic moves air into and out of the lungs to facilitate gas exchange. These processes may be considered a primary function of the organization. We will let the profiteers drown in shallow water. All constructed bureaucracies are subject to the cycles of the body bureaucratic. We plant the seeds of the future in the present. The human scale of time exists within the geological scale of time. The body bureaucratic implements its best standards and practices for collective survival. Body acclimation strategies, extreme heat and humidity. As global temperatures rise and threaten the viability of human and non-human life, it is urgent and necessary for humans and co-species to adapt. While our goals as an institution are centered around communal co-survival, we have implemented individual acclimation programs to assist in the transition between our current situations and our idealized futures. Each of our acclimation programs considers extreme heat and humidity in its implementation. Our material investigations of mylar rescue blankets have found the material reflects approximately 90% of radiant heat and can be used as a heat shield. Our underwater breath holding techniques will help humans acclimate to longer periods of underwater body cooling. Our microplastic malleability strategies may, in the future, allow us to consciously harness the plastics within our bodies to create additional heat shielding for internal organs. Body acclimation strategy, breath holding. As sea levels rise, it is urgent and necessary for humans and co-species to adapt. Breath holding strategies were the first acclimation strategies developed by CPCH in anticipation of sea level rise in coastal areas. Using guided breathing and meditation techniques, participants are encouraged to practice specific strategies of holding carbon dioxide inside their body, over time increasing their body's ability to acclimate to underwater conditions. 
While this program is primarily used to encourage psychological resilience and a sense of preparedness for people in sacrifice zones, it may, in the future, provide real survival techniques through continued evolution, investigation, and research. Body acclimation strategy, microplastic malleability. As stewards of hyperobjects, we are working towards a goal of survivable coexistence and coevolution with human engineered entities. Internal microplastic malleability is a proposed acclimation strategy for microplastic profusion. Using guided internal temperature regulation and meditation techniques, participants are encouraged to harness the microplastics that have accumulated in their bodies as a malleable medium that can be intentionally sculpted within internal organ systems. While this program is primarily used to encourage psychological resilience and a sense of preparedness for this generation of hyperobject stewards, it may, in the future, provide real survival techniques and conscious control of internal organ systems through continued investigation and research. The Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt and my chemical self on vacation. I'm laying on the beach with nothing between my body and the grainy mud and sargassum on the shore. I'm prickling from a sunburn all over, but the ground is cool. I flip over to lay on my back, a preservation program. It smells like rotten eggs and I mostly have the beach to myself. Tourists stopped coming to Daytona Beach a while ago because of the lingering sargassum belt. The smell is awful and it burns your eyes and sinuses until you get used to it. All the mom and pop restaurants and tacky souvenir shops filled with t-shirts and gator heads dotting the boardwalk closed up after the second or third summer of it. And now all that's left is abandoned monolithic hotel chain high rises and the scaffolded shelves of ill-fated condo construction projects. Stubborn, sun-leathered locals still live in bungalows as close to a half a mile to the shore, and the trailers edge closer in, patching the dunes with newly laid and dangerously angled code-violating concrete slabs. I keep thinking of this essay my internet friend shared with me. He's a perfumist who lives in the greater Orlando area who I have never met in person. From creating spices for the mind. Given the importance and complexity of olfactory perception, it is possible to hypothesize the existence of what can be called the human chemical self, which is fundamentally different in its function from what is generally understood by a human or physical self as constituted by the data provided to the mind by the distance-based sensory modalities of vision, hearing, and touch. This proposed chemical self, in order to be complete, should have its own mechanisms of communication with the world, just as it should have its own value system and even its own memory. The so-called Proustian effect, when one has a strikingly totalizing recollection of a particular episode of one's past after encountering the associated odor many years later, can only be explained by the existence of memory mechanisms in our body that somehow constantly record chemical characteristics of our environment. Smells appear to suspend the basic function of language, that of primary naming, which makes olfactory references serve as kinds of voids in languages signifying fabric. Language can only process the olfactory by referring to its material sources, the smell emitting object, such as the smell of carrot, sea, my mother's hair, etc. I'm thinking about the Western project of deodorization that began during the Enlightenment and carried through modernism a sensory hierarchy that prioritized vision and encouraged the secretivity of our fugitive chemical selves. I inhale deeply and let myself taste the rotten egg smell on purpose. 
The notability procedure for my body archive has more to do with the inevitability of things than some predetermined value of them. Someone farther down the beach has a boombox and is blasting familiar reggaeton hits from years ago. El Alpha, Bad Bunny, and Tokicha. I love the repetitive bass and collage of references to dancehall rhythms and Dembo especially. Another living archive. An anchored signifier and pulsating signification. Little waves are pushing up closer and closer until there's cool water all around me. On the breeze, the scent of sunscreen momentarily masks the sulfur. My eyes are burning from brightness and sea salt, and the ocean is sparkling. I remember my internet friend, Carter Weeks Maddox, the perfumist, wrote about how Horkheimer and Adorno missed out on the fact that the perfume industry also created mass media. Carter said they were too traumatized by what they'd witnessed in Europe to think about the real parameters of what constitutes the culture industry. He typed the paragraphs out on his Instagram story, and I had to hold the slides down with my thumbs to read the long blocks of text. The sun is setting, and a half a mile up the beach is a lionfish food truck. I can smell the hot oil mingling with the stench in the air, and my stomach is gurgling. You can stand and watch them skin and clean the fish while you wait for their Floridian ceviche or a deep fried filet on a soft bun. Poisonous spines pointed safely down on the cutting board. Three quick cuts with a sharp knife. Beneath the pectoral fin, down to the belly, and another shallow cut just deep enough to split the skin all the way down right beneath the poison spines to the tail. A last cut below the belly. A yank and the skin peels off, revealing buttery tissue beneath. Flat knife, parallel to the cutting board, filleting the meat, just skimming the ribs. Fresh pink bloodline. I keep walking up the beach in the dark, still tasting lionfish and tonguing bits of cilantro off my teeth. I haven't been to a dentist in many years, and I'm anxious about the plaque buildup under my gums. Another collection entered into the body archive. I take a gulp of beer from my thermos and swish it around in my mouth, like Kesha in that song from 2009. I can see a pink neon sign that looks like it's floating right over a sandbar farther out. I wade out to get closer, parting the slimy clumps of leaves with my fingers spread wide. I feel something cool and smooth on my foot. The sand is covering a tile step. I'm overwhelmed by the smell of popcorn and perfume. Another step up, and I'm standing in an icing by Claire's on the sandbar. I'm sitting on a tall stool as the piercer swabs my right earlobe with an alcohol wipe and gently marks the dot in the center with a felt tip marker. Now my left ear lobe. She loads the gun with a steel piercing stud and raises it up to the side of my face. She tells me to breathe in, and one, two, three. I exhale to a loud mechanical click and cold pressure in my ear. It stings just a little bit, and then the other one, an entry into my body archive. My eyes are closed, and I'm listening to the sound of the waves lapping against the sandbar outside. The sulfur smell is mingling with the mall smell. The new piercing stings as the woman twists an earring backing into the steel post. I wade back out into the water and towards the shore again. My 4D self sings the body bureaucratic. We sing the body bureaucratic, trademark. The armies of hyperobjects we love engirth us and we engirth them. They will not let us go off until we go with them, respond to them and discorrupt them and charge them full with the charge of lithium. Black hole burps up remains of a star it consumed three years ago, scientists puzzled. A looping, coiling Ouroboros of intestinal tracts and located somewhere within the jejunum, a wormhole. 
As a being that can travel in four dimensions, I experience a very physical sensation of the flows of time. This sensation is frequently a gastrointestinal one, accompanied by the nauseating pull of a swift change in elevation. My chemical self, queasy as I constantly record the characteristics of my environment, burps up the partially digested remains of one of my 4D selves. The thin red jellies within you or within me, the bones and the marrow in the bones, sometimes the archive eats itself. To my 4D self, from The Archivist. Subject, Research Log, Daytona Beach, Florida. Slingshot wormhole, tangent vector to a world line. The horizon line is long and straight and flat, light blue and dark blue stacked on top of each other. Beachgoers have set up umbrellas and chairs and water purifiers and barbecues under the big shadows of the abandoned high rises. The broiling hot bright stripes between them are thin and unpopulated. The shadows start to roll and distort with the shapes of the waves about 500 feet into the water. There's one shadow much taller than the rest. I decided I wanted to try the Daytona Beach slingshot at Screamers Park. It shoots you 365 feet in the air, zero to 100 miles per hour in less than a second. Six Gs of force. Supposedly, you experience weightlessness for a fraction of a second, too. Then they give you a USB wristband loaded with the file of the footage afterwards. Though this is a physical risk to the archive, I think being weightless for a fraction of a second might help me with my research. The lap bar is down, and I'm being lowered into a simulated volcano. Machine fog, flashing blue and red and pink lights, and fake skeletons hide the moving parts. An attendant wearing a blue polo and cargo shorts motions to the ride operator. Five mechanical clicks and the circular frame around the seat lowers down even farther. Then the nauseating pull of a swift change in elevation. I split. World line, world sheet, world volume. A fraction of a second of weightlessness. I close my eyes all eight at once, and the light floaters behind all of my eyelids organize themselves into a shimmering surface, curving at the sides and extending into the horizon. Thank you all again so much for joining us tonight. I will be answering any questions in the live stream chat.